Well, hello, everyone, and, and welcome to LifePoint Online. My name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here. We are continuing in this series, uh, You Asked For It. And I want to begin by asking you a question. It's kind of a mass survey. You can just answer it out loud wherever you're at. When you hear the words COVID-19, what comes to mind? Are there any happy thoughts by any chance? Probably not. Like most of you, along with, you know, tons of people across the globe, they are, we are feeling the pain of this pandemic. And in the many of the conversations that I've had with people about this, people are asking a lot of questions, tough questions, good questions, uh, financial questions, and spiritual questions. You and I are asking questions. The media, the government, our families, our coworkers, our friends are all asking questions. Now, we've all seen those commercials on TV for, you know, like some pharmaceutical product or drug, and, and they paint this wonderful picture of this amazing new drug. And then at the end of the commercial, it warns you about all the possible side effects that might occur if you take it. And the possible side effects are almost always worse than the problem that you're trying to cure. And it struck me this week as I was thinking about this stuff that, that life ought to come with warnings about side effects. I have a brand new granddaughter, Kira, a beautiful little baby. And every baby, when they're born, they, they ought to have a little tag on their foot. And on one side, it would talk about all the, the wonderful things about this new life, the joy and the adventure and the cuteness. And then on the other side, it would mention the side effects, side effects like, like sleepless nights, like vomit, you know, in the, in the backseat of the car and poopy diapers that, that have a tendency to explode on the way to, to church and, and, and side effects like debts on student loans and side effects like, like dudes that want to date and maybe even marry your daughter. Daughter, and now a granddaughter, yikes, because we all know full well that there are side effects to life. There's pain, there's suffering, there's heartache, there's disappointment, and yes, there's pandemics and even death. And in fact, Jesus did warn us about the side effects of life. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, you will have suffering in this world. Jesus guaranteed us. He, he warned us that we will have troubles in life. We will have difficulties and sorrow and suffering. And Jesus tells us this kind of stuff is going to happen. But in that passage, uh, Jesus didn't really address the question of why. Why is there suffering? And that question is certainly on the minds of, of a lot of people right now, probably on your mind. And in fact, that question has been on people's minds throughout history. And today's message is something that's been one of life's great theological and philosophical debates for thousands of years. Why does God allow suffering? And folks, I really do wish I could give you the, you know, all neat and tidy answer from God on this issue, but I can't. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, it says, my knowledge is incomplete. See, it's so important for us to understand that in this world, in this life, we don't have complete knowledge. We don't have perfect knowledge of all issues, especially this one. But it's also equally important for, for us to understand that, that there are some things that we can know. It's like when you're, when you're driving in a thick fog and your sight is very limited, and the only thing that's lighting up the way are the taillights of the car that are in front of you, and you follow those lights to a, to, a, to a place of safety, to a better place, and the same is true here. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, in the message paraphrase, it puts it like this. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. So this fog that, that we're kind of squinting through, it might limit our ability to understand it all, but there are some key biblical truths that, that offer us some light. And if we keep our eyes focused on those points of light, they will take us to a better place, a better place of, of understanding where our hearts and our minds can find and experience some peace. So what are those points of light? Well, the first one is God did not create evil and suffering. God did not create evil and suffering. I've heard this a lot uh, about that, that COVID-19 is an act of God, like some form of punishment on a wicked world. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, that is not true. God is not the creator of evil. He's not the creator of suffering. 
And this answers the question that you hear so often that why didn't God create a world where there wasn't any evil and suffering in the first place? Why didn't he just create the earth to be a perfect place to begin with? And the answer to that is he did. In Genesis 1.31, it says that God saw all that he had made and it was very good, very good indeed. So if God did not create evil and suffering, and if what he created was very good, then where did the suffering come from in the first place? Well, the answer to that is God, in his wisdom, he decided to give human beings free will. Why did he give us free will? Because the greatest value in the universe is love, to love God and to love other people. Love is the highest and the greatest value. And the only way that, that, that the greatest value of love can really be attained is if we have free will. Then we can make the choice to, to love or not to love because true love must involve a choice. It's like, it's like those, those dolls where you press the button and back in the day when I was a kid, you'd pull the string, okay? And you push the button and it says, I love you. Now, does that doll really love you? Of course not. It's programmed to say it, right? It has no choice. Now, you don't need to tell a little girl that, all right? If she thinks her Care Bear loves her, that's fine. But the doll is programmed to say it. It must say it. So it's really not love. For you to really express love, you must be able to make the choice to not to love in order for your expression of love to be true. And God, knowing this, created a world in which he gave human beings free will. And the problem is we've abused that free will. We've rejected God. We've walked away from him. And the broken relationship with God, this rejection of God is sin. And the result of man's sin has been the introduction of two kinds of evil into the world. And so it's so important. It's so important for us to get this. The first kind of evil is moral evil. Moral evil is the immorality and and the pain and the suffering that results when when we make the choice to be selfish, to be mean, to be hateful, to be arrogant and uncaring and abusive and hurtful. In fact, Romans 3.23, it makes it crystal clear. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that we've all done things. We've all done things out of our free will that have resulted in hurt and harm to ourselves and other people. In fact, it's estimated that that 95% of all the suffering in this world is the result of my sin and your sin, the sin of all people. Consider your hand for a moment. I can either take this, this hand and hurt someone, or I can take this hand and help someone. It's my choice. But it isn't fair if I hurt someone and then we ask the question, why does God allow evil and suffering? You've made the choice to hurt someone. Well, it's this kind of evil, this moral evil that we're most familiar with and usually gets most of our attention until a couple of months ago when the coronavirus hit, which is the second kind of evil. This evil is called natural evil, natural evil. These are things like viruses, things like illnesses, things like cancer and AIDS and and things like earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, natural phenomena that cause pain and suffering and destruction. Natural evil, uh, it too is the result of sin in a fallen world. And this is how one author explained it. He writes, when we human beings told God to shove off, he partially honored our request. Nature began to revolt. The earth was cursed. Genetic breakdown and disease began. Pain became part of the human experience. And we all know that that is so true. After Adam and Eve first rejected God, some of the consequences are found in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 17. It says, the ground is cursed because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles. The Bible is telling us that, that because of sin, nature itself is cursed. Romans 8, it says that we know that all creation is still groaning and it's in pain. In other words, it's as if nature itself is crying out. It's in pain. It too is, is suffering, longing for things to be set right again. 
So sin is the source of disorder and chaos within us, and sin is the source of natural disasters like pandemics and and hurricanes. And these things are the inevitable consequence of a fallen, broken world in which we all live. So let's make one thing really clear as we unpack this huge question. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. Pandemics are not an act of God. It is true that he did create a world with the potential for evil and suffering to take place. And why did he do that? Because it was the only way. It was the only way that he could create a world with free will, a world in which the greatest value of love can be experienced by you and by me. And some people say, well, couldn't God have foreseen that people were going to rebel against him? Couldn't God have seen it in advance that things like this pandemic would happen? Well, the answer to that is, of course. COVID is not a surprise to God. Our rebellion is not a surprise to him. He knew it was going to happen. So why did he go ahead and create things anyway? Well, the answer to that, again, is like being a parent. You knew before you adopted your child or or had a child that there was a a very real possibility that your child would experience suffering and and pain and your, your child would experience illness and disappointment and failures in their life. And they may even reject you as a parent and walk away from you and cause incredible, immeasurable heartache. And yet knowing that, that very real possibility of all the negative stuff, you went ahead and had kids anyway. Why did you do it? Well, because you knew that there was also the potential for tremendous joy. There was tremendous potential to to have a loving, deep, and intimate relationship with your child. And the same thing is true uh, with us and God. Yes, he knew that we would rebel against him, but he also knew that countless people would choose to follow him, that countless people would choose to to love him, that countless people would choose to to spend eternity with him. He knew that, that countless people would choose to share Christ's love with a hurting world. And from God's perspective, it was all worth it for those people, even though it meant for him the suffering and the horrible death of his own son on a cross. So first, it helps us to to remember as I look through this fog of suffering that that God did not create evil and suffering. The second point of light is this. God uses suffering to accomplish good. Although God did not create suffering and suffering is not good, God can and does use it to accomplish good. We've heard it said, God doesn't waste a hurt, and he doesn't. And there are many ways that God does this. And, And I'll quickly mention just two of them. First, God uses suffering to draw people toward Christ. This is huge. And think about this. For many of us, it's only after or during a season of of suffering or pain do many of us turn toward God. That's true in my own life. And we all know that's true. That's been part of so many of your stories. It's only after disaster or suffering or pain do many individuals and even nations turn back to God. That was true of of the nation of Israel in the Bible. Now, why is this? It's because suffering, suffering brings repentance. What is repentance? Repentance, it just means a change of mind or a change of heart. It means a a change in behavior. And I've said this before, and, and it's so true that we usually don't change when we see the light. We usually only change when we feel the heat. As humans, we learn the hard way. As C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse, to awaken a deaf world. God does not want us to suffer, but he does want us to have a relationship with him. And you see, God operates on a a very different value system than we do. God has a different perspective when it comes to the issue of our suffering. He considers some things, he considers some things in life even worse than our suffering and pain. We're, and, and, you, and you might say, well, what could be worse? What could be worse than the type of suffering we're, we're seeing with this virus and other things around the world? Well, as I read the Bible, apparently God thinks it's much worse for people to go through their, their whole life separated from him, never knowing their plan for him, never knowing uh, the joy that he has for them or the purpose that he has for them, going through your entire life without knowing the forgiveness and the freedom that Christ offers. 
And even with the amount of suffering this virus caused, it's even worse in God's mind for you to personally uh, never know and experience his love for you. And over the past few weeks, we've certainly seen and we've certainly heard a lot of people crying out for God's help and drawing close to him for hope and strength. God, help me. I need you. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. It says, for the sadness that is used by God brings a change of heart that does what? It leads to salvation. And there is no regret in that. I mean, look at the, the last person, part of that verse. It says, there's no regret in that. I mean, that's just like a, an incredibly radical statement. And especially in light of current events, some of you might even be offended by that. But it says we should not regret the suffering that God has allowed. Why? Because it leads to a change of heart. It causes us to seek God, to find God, to know God, to have a relationship with him and to grow in our relationship with him. And God knows that the joy and the experience of knowing him is so great, it's worth whatever suffering if it draws us to his son, Jesus. And the second thing, God also uses suffering to display Christ to the world. To display Christ to the world. Look at this incredible promise from God in Romans 8, 28. Incredible promise. It says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Great verse. But now this verse, it doesn't say that everything is good or that God causes everything. It doesn't say that. Again, God does not cause evil and suffering. He doesn't cause wars and viruses and cancer and hurricanes. God doesn't cause those things to happen. The Bible says that God causes everything to work together for good. He promises to bring good out of the bad, to bring good out of our suffering. And now there are two sides to this verse. One, unfortunately, this is not a promise for everybody. It says, if you love God. So I encourage you to love God. If you do love God, he will take all the suffering in your life and he will bring something good out of it. And when that happens, when the world sees good things rising up through the ashes of human suffering, and if we rightfully give God the credit for that, by doing that, we are putting Jesus on display to the world. And the other side of this verse is this. As horrible as this virus is, this is the perfect opportunity for those of us that, that do love God to be the hands and feet of Christ. God uses those of us that do love him to help fulfill that promise to bring good out of the bad. He uses us to do that. And the, the seasons like this and, and the, the virus, this can, this can be the, the church's finest moment. The time is now for the, for the church to, to be Jesus to those that are suffering. I mean, every time I read and watch the news, that there's another heroic story about what some Christian or, or, or Christian organization is doing to help people. Man, churches are feeding people. They're providing resources. They're, they're, they're providing financial support for people. They're counseling people. So many Christians are sharing the love of Christ with so many hurting people in so many ways. And the entire world is watching in real time. It's like one gigantic living three-dimensional billboard that says, God loves you. Yeah, it's terrible out there, but God loves you. Jesus died for you. Folks, yes, the world has changed. But God's mission for us, the mission for his church and his followers, it remains the same. So although suffering is not good, God uses it to accomplish good. And the third point of light that God wants us to, to understand and then to share, he wants, this one he wants us to share with those that are suffering. God has a place for us where suffering doesn't exist. Point of light number three. God has a place for us where suffering doesn't exist. And I don't say this to, to minimize the suffering that, that so many of you, you know, are going through because of this virus and other things that you're dealing with. I know that lots of people, just like many of you, are going through much worse things than, than I ever have. But all of us should find this extremely encouraging. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.17. This verse was written by the Apostle Paul. And this guy, talk about suffering. He suffered beatings and shipwrecks and imprisonments and, and hunger and thirst and homelessness and even huge storms. And this was a guy who on, on five, count him five different occasions, he was whipped 39 times by a whip that was made of leather and bone that shredded his body. 
Multiply that out, 39 times five. And on three different occasions, people took rocks and they pelted him to a bloody pulp. Paul experienced far more pain than most people will will ever go through. And this is what he says about suffering. Look at that verse. It says, our suffering is light and temporary. And is producing for us an eternal glory that is greater than anything we can imagine. Paul put it again uh, this way in Romans 8, 18. He says, I consider our present sufferings insignificant compared to the glory that will soon be revealed to us. Paul here, he's trying to help us change our perspective. Rather than focus on on the sufferings of the here and now, which if we do that, folks, I encourage you, if you do that, it has a tendency to fill you with bitterness and despair, and I'm seeing it happening in some of your lives. Instead, Paul is saying, hey, look at today's suffering through eternal eyes, through the eyes of heaven. He, he's saying, change your perspective. Rather than focusing on what's lost, focus on what's left. This is earth. And man, it's, it's a world that is far from perfect. We all know that. It's a world of viruses and violence and cancer and sin and chaos. And, and, and we have to be reminded, though, this life is it's just temporary. We were not created to live here on earth forever. This life will come to an end for all of us. And in the next life, the life eternal, God promises in heaven that, that the suffering will cease. It will be no more. And living in the eternal presence and glory of God for all of eternity, all our suffering, it's going to pale in comparison to what God has in store for those who love him. I love the words of 1 Corinthians 2.9. Great verse. You want to memorize a great verse this week? This one. It says, no eye has seen, no, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. God promises a time and place called heaven, a very real place. And there he's going to put everything back into his original intended context. What's heaven going to be like? Well, in one word, indescribable. Indescribable. Our minds, it says our minds can't even conceive how amazing and incredible heaven will be. We know it's going to be an absolutely perfect place with with perfect sights and, and perfect sounds and perfect smells. I mean, perfect smells. There ain't going to be no more Lysol. I love it. But there's not going to be any more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more waiting for unemployment checks, no more prejudice. Mankind will be united with God in perfect harmony forever. And nature will once again be completely restored. In other words, no viruses. And in my heaven, you ain't going to have to wear any stupid masks and you ain't going to have to wash your hands a hundred times a day. It ain't going to happen there. And a lot of times you hear people say, well, there are so many people suffering in this world at this very moment. Why doesn't God just come back right now and cause all the suffering across the globe to end? And the reason God won't come back right now is because of his love, his love for you. And that may seem a little odd, but look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish, so he's giving more time for everyone to repent. That changed the heart. God is saying, I'm holding back the curtain on history. Why? Because of some of you. Some of you that, that are watching this message today, you don't know Jesus yet. You, you know about Jesus, but you, you don't personally know him yet. You don't have a relationship with him in, in your heart. And some of your friends and your family members and your coworkers, they don't know the love of Christ yet. And because of this virus, there are lots of people across the United States and around the globe that have a firsthand intimate relationship with suffering, but they don't have an intimate relationship with the Savior. And if God comes back right now, there's a lot of people that would be shut out of knowing Christ, a lot of people that would be shut out of the glory of heaven forever. And the reason that God hasn't come back yet is an expression of his unbelievable love for you. And the bottom line, 
The bottom line, folks, the ultimate answer from God to this question of why is there suffering, God's ultimate answer is not words. It's the living word. God's ultimate answer is not, it's not an explanation. It's the incarnation, Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus is fully God and became fully man. He came into our, into our human experience to live among us and to die for our sins. And for me, I could never love a God who was distant and disinterested and, and detached, just kind of watching or suffering from, you know, some faraway place. I could never love a God like that. But I cannot help but love a God who says, I will enter into your suffering. I will enter into your pain. I, I will enter into your viruses, into your illnesses, into your despair. I will come into your world and I will suffer the most horrible death on the cross so that you can have an eternity with me in heaven. I can't help but love a God like that. Jesus is the ultimate answer to the question of suffering. Jesus is right there with us in, in the lowest places of our lives. Jesus is not just some, you know, some friend who can merely empathize with you and just sits beside you in your suffering. If you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, man, he lives inside of you. That means that, means that your suffering is his suffering. And your pain is his pain. And your tears become his tears. And Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. He says, I have conquered the world. I have overcome the world. God promises us that in a relationship with Jesus, we find a peace that is unlimited a joy that is unshakable. And we find the courage, we find the courage to conquer anything, anything the world brings our way. Jesus, Jesus Christ is the ultimate answer to the question of suffering. Let's pray. I want to encourage you in this moment to make this prayer your prayer. Something like this in, in the quietness of your heart. Dear God, thank you for your goodness to me. Thank you for loving me and, and caring about every detail of my life. Thank you for sharing my pain and sharing my suffering. And most of all, thank you for, for sending Jesus to save me. I believe that he died on the cross for me and I want to receive him as my savior. Please forgive my sins and accept me into your family. I want to learn to love, trust, and follow you the rest of my life on earth. And then I want to join you in heaven forever. Amen.